don't go because we have a top keynote speaker you cannot miss to talk to us about the future of technology and the technology of the future we have with us a man that leaves nobody indifferent trust me once you've met him you will never forget him besides he's the guy with the mickey mouse tie with a PhD in interdisciplinary science and some names on his CV of the likes of uh, MIT, INSEAD, and Singularity University, he's in turn an engineer, management consultant, author, thinker, and futurist, and keeps reinventing himself. But at heart, he has remained a student of the human condition and the world we live in. He's thinking about the future possibilities and how the world can be improved. He said, between 2029 and 2045, you won't know anymore if you are talking to a human or artificial intelligence. I sometimes doubt whether he's human himself. And you will see that his enthusiasm and optimism about the future is energizing and highly contagious. Please, let's welcome José Luis Cordeiro. <laughs> Um, good morning to everybody. I am happy to talk about the future because that is where we are going to live the rest of our lives. I work with different institutions about the future, and uh, one of them is the Millennium Project that began as the futuristic part of the United Nations, and we do forecasting and trends, uh, and we take a look at the global challenges of humanity, and also every year we publish a book uh, about the future of humanity. Also, I coordinated a study about the future of Latin America, which is the region where I was born. And then we presented this in several places, like the World Economic Forum, Davos, Switzerland. And uh, I talked to several interesting people, like Nobel laureate uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, and then also to Donald Trump. We even made a program on TV for CNN. Uh, he's a very interesting person, as you might understand. Anyway, um, development is going faster and faster. There is an acceleration of economic growth. The first country in humanity that doubled its income per capita in a systematic way was the United Kingdom. And it needed 58 years between 1780 and 1838 to be the first country in the history of humanity that doubled its income per capita. Now that has been accelerating, accelerating, and the world record today is China. China every seven, eight, nine years doubles its income per capita. And now India is catching up, and also Africa. So we truly live in incredible times where there is more economic growth, growth for everybody. And it only began in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. Until the 18th century, the human condition was poverty, misery, hunger, early death, average life expectancy in the 18th century was less than 30 years. Most of you would be dead two centuries ago. But fortunately, the Industrial Revolution began, and science and technology accelerated economic growth. And in the 19th century, we grew about 100%. In the 20th century, about 400%. And in this century, we might grow between 2,000 and 3,000%. We have seen nothing yet. We live in incredible times. In the next two decades, we are going to see more changes than in the last 2,000 years. So everything is accelerating. But there are always enemies, like you probably know the Amish. The Amish still live in the 18th century. They are caught in the Malthusian trap. They live in poverty compared to what we do today. And I'm saying this because several groups will oppose economic development and technology in the future. So we have to be ready for the Amish, the Malthusians of the future. Um, in 2009, I began as one of the founding faculty of Singularity University, which is really not a university, and it is not about the singularity, but it is a very interesting place where we talk about exponential technologies with the support of NASA, Google, and now many other companies. The idea of the singularity um, was popularized by my friend Ray Kurzweil, who is also from my alma mater, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he said that technology is moving so fast that between 2029 and 2045, we are going to reach 
the level of human intelligence with computers. So artificial intelligence will reach human intelligence, and that will be the end of the human age, so that you do not sleep tonight. That will be the end of the human age, but it will be the beginning of the post-human age, of immortal humans and incredibly intelligent humans, because we are going to enhance our intelligence with artificial intelligence. In fact, Time Magazine published a whole issue about the singularity, and they took the late year of 2045, but we expect this to be before then, maybe as soon as in the next 10, 15 years. Anyway, many people still don't believe this. For those who do not believe, let me show you history. Uh, I used this 30 years ago. These are the IBM punch cards. This is basically 10 by 100, which is 1,000. This is 1K of memory, mechanical memory. But unfortunately, you had to make holes, and then you cannot change the memory here. Therefore, the first electromagnetic memories were created. And this was also 1K. But this 1K was much better because you could erase. Also, it had a bigger hole. But 30 years ago, we had, in Spanish, I like to say, 1K plus 1K. How much is 1K plus 1K? 1KK. 30 years ago, we had 1KK of memory. Really horrible. Fortunately, technology kept on improving, and we had then this, which was 512 KKs. I have another one here of 1.4 mega. And uh, today, we can have... Uh, pen drives, I have one here from the World Economic Forum, Davos, of 128 gigabytes. This has happened in the last 30 years. We went from caca to 128 gigabytes. So what do you think will happen in the next uh, 20, 30 years? You will remember me, and you will remember caca, but this will be caca in 30 years. We will have devices smaller than this and more powerful than the human brain. And that will be the beginning of the technological singularity. This is happening in all areas, also in medicine, in biotechnology. And as you can see, this is my human genome. I will show you my human genome, the partial sequence, so that you don't know everything about me. But with little devices like this, this is a gene chip to sequence the genome, you will know uh, your physical characteristics, the color of your eyes, if you are tall, if you didn't know it already and which diseases you will have. What is the propensity for you, the probability for you to get Alzheimer's, to get Parkinson? After you sequence your human genome, you will know what you will die of. Isn't this interesting? But so that you do not die of that, because in the future, medicine will no longer be curative. Medicine will be preventive. Also, you will know where your family comes from. This is my paternal line. And you can see on the bottom right, I am a descendant of Genghis Khan. So no one wants to mess around with me. Now I will show you my maternal line. And you can see on my mother's family, I come down from Marie Antoinette. I am from a very aristocratic family between Genghis Khan and Marie Antoinette. All of you will know where you come from after you sequence your genome, and you can build your genealogical tree and for the first time verify if your father is really your father. But more interesting than looking back backwards is looking forward, and we will design our children in the future. And if you do not design your children, your children will sue you for not designing them. In fact, you are part of the last human generation that has not been designed, and that is here by mistake. All of you are here by mistake. In the future, we will design our children. And this is an experiment I did with one of my students at Singularity University, and we shared genes. This is a theoretical experiment to see which genes we would have and then for our children and choose the ones you want. You might think that this is expensive, right? This is not expensive. This was incredibly expensive when it began. In 1990, the Human Genome Project began, and it ended in 2003. It took 13 years, and it cost over $1 billion to sequence the first human genome. Today, in 2017, you can sequence your complete genome for about $850 today, in two days. 
and we expect that by 2025 you will sequence your genome for $10 in one minute. I want you to look at those numbers because that, that is really incredibly exponential, both in time from 13 years to 10 minutes and in cost from $1 billion to $10. This is happening with all technologies that are moving exponentially and things become uh, move faster, they become uh, smaller, cheaper, and much better. However, we do not understand exponential change because we think linearly. And things are very different in the linear world or in the exponential world. If I walk linearly and each step is one meter, after 30 steps, I have walked 30 meters. But if I walk exponentially, and I double, double, double. After 30 doublings, I have walked over 1 billion meters, and I have gone around planet Earth 26 times. We don't understand this, however, because our brains think linearly. But get ready for the exponential world that is coming with technology. To talk about the future, I love Mafalda, who is a very famous Argentinian. And like all people from Argentina, she knows everything. And if she doesn't know it, she invents it. So Argentina was, uh, I mean, Mafalda was asked, what is the future? And she said, the future is no longer what it used to be. Very deep, huh? very Argentinian. But the future is really different. It's changing fast. Let me give you an example. As you see, I love Mickey Mouse. You can see my tie. But uh, next to Mickey Mouse is the largest company in South America that probably none of you recognizes. It's Petróleos de Venezuela, the largest company of South America. But Mickey Mouse sells more than all the petroleum from Venezuela. And this is an example of the mind factoring. We are moving from manufacturing into mind factoring. I'll give you another example about mind factoring with my mind uh, Mickey Mouse hat. Uh, this is made completely of petroleum, probably Venezuelan petroleum. The plastic comes from petroleum, the synthetic fiber from petroleum, the acrylic paint from petroleum, my tie from polyester from petroleum, all from petroleum. If you buy a Mickey Mouse hat, it is about $10, or as Americans say, 9.99. And it comes from a barrel of oil but you can make about a thousand Mickey Mouse hats from one barrel of oil. So that makes 1,000 times 10, that makes 10,000. And the barrel of oil is only $50. So where is the money? The money is never in the raw materials. The money is in adding value, adding value. Another example of adding value is in coffee. Um, all of you can recognize a Starbucks. And if you don't recognize it, at least you can read Starbucks. But on the left is the symbol of Colombia, the, the man called Juan Valdez. He represents all the coffee growing industry of Colombia. And most people don't know Juan Valdez. And a Starbucks sells more than 10 times all the coffee that is produced in Colombia. So again, the value is not in raw materials. It is in adding value to the industry. We futures, we talk about four ways to think about the future. The worst way is to be passive, like an ostrich, horrible. A little bit less bad is to be reactive, like a firefighter. Much better is to be preactive, to prepare yourself to the future. But the best is to be proactive. You can create the future. You can visualize the scenarios and how to get to those scenarios. So I hope that we don't have many ostriches here or if we have ostriches, they should be technological ostriches to see the future and what is going to happen. Ten years ago, I went to visit Sir Arthur C. Clarke, very famous for science fiction, like uh, Space Odyssey 2001 and many other books and movies in Hollywood. But he's also famous for the three laws of the future. And he said half a century ago, first law, when a famous scientist says that something is possible, he's probably right. But when he says it is impossible, he's probably wrong. Second law of the future, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture past those limits into the impossible. And third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 
So now I am going to talk about magic because the future will look magical to us. For example, 30 years ago, personal computers were just beginning. When I did my first thesis at MIT, there were no personal computers. I used a primitive technology called typewriter. I don't know if you have seen that primitive technology. It's a caca technology, typewriters. 20 years ago, mobile phones were beginning. 10 years ago, companies like Google, Facebook were growing. So what are we going to see in the next 10, 20 years? We are going to see magic. One of those magical things will be the control of aging. In fact, we say that aging is a disease, but a curable disease. And we expect to cure aging in the next 20 to 30 years. A friend of mine, Aubrey de Grey, actually created a foundation called the Methuselah Foundation to create immortal mice. Not just for the mice, but then for humans. In the last 10 years, they have been able to extend the lifespan of mice almost three times. For mosquitoes, four times, and for worms, six times. In fact, today we know that cancer cells are immortal, are biologically immortal. How many of you knew that? How many of you? OK, a few of you. You are very educated people here. But most humans, 99% of humans, do not know that cancer cells do not age. Cancer cells are biologically immortal. The proof that immortality is possible is that we already have immortal cells. Cancer cells and germinal cells. All of you have germinal cells, and your germinal cells do not age. That doesn't mean they are completely immortal, because they can die if you kill them, but they do not age. Cancer and germinal cells do not age, are biologically immortal. Um, because of that, most uh, high-tech companies are moving into medicine. Like Google created a company called Calico, California Life Company, which objective is to cure aging and to kill death. Actually, I love to say we are going to see the death of death in the next three decades. The death of death. Google is working on killing death. Microsoft announced that in 10 years, they will cure cancer. Why Microsoft? Because Microsoft is an IT company that can sequence the genome and find the mutations that made cancer cells immortal. We are going to cure cancer in 10 years, and HIV, and malaria, and many other diseases in one decade. And Mark Zuckerberg announced with his wife, Priscilla Chan, who is a medical doctor who has studied biology at Harvard, that they are going to give all their money to cure all diseases, including aging. So don't believe me. Believe Facebook, believe Google, believe uh, Microsoft, and believe IBM also working on these ideas. So that is plan A. Plan A is not to die. And I hope you do not die in the next 30 years so that you might become immortal if you want to. But if you die, we have plan B. Plan B is called cryopreservation. And there are hundreds of people who are cryopreserved. And this began also half a century ago with the cryopreservation of eggs, embryos, other organs. And now there are hundreds of people who are cryopreserved as well in different places, like in Arizona or in Russia. And I was in charge, sadly, with some friends. And I have, I, I, I've seen a couple of my friends here. And we were in charge of cryonically suspending this, the first Spanish person in the peninsula. Well, he was Catalan. Maybe that will not be Spanish soon. But anyway, um, now he's having, he's cryonically suspended since February the 10th last year. And he's having a very cool life. And we expect to reanimate him in four decades. Anyway, I invite you all also to come to a conference I am organizing in California called RAD, the Revolution Against Aging and Death. We expect to kill death in the next three decades. And if you come to San Diego with me next year, you will meet Ray Kurzweil, my friend, also the father of the singularity, and Liz Parrish at the bottom right, who is the first human that is being rejuvenated now. This is not for the future. This is now. You can look. Uh, I've tried to find her in Google. We call her patient zero, the first human who is being rejuvenated. So come to me, with me to California if you want to live forever. And these are the four technologies that will change everything, nano, bio, info, cogno. And these technologies are converging in, into what we call the technological singularity. The two technologies on top, nano and bio, are the hardware of life. 
and the two technologies on the bottom, Info and Cogno are the software of life. And both the software and the hardware are converging into the technological singularity. In the next 20 years, plus or minus 10. And then we have virtual worlds. We will have more experiences in augmented reality, in virtual reality. But what is the complexity of the human hardware? Today, we have been able to create artificial viruses, artificial bacteria, and soon we will be able to create artificial humans. A human is only three gigabytes of data, three gigabytes. Here I have 128 gigabytes. So how many people can I fit in this pen drive? 128 gigabytes divided by three makes 42.6. I can fit here 42 Spanish and one little Portuguese, okay, in this pen drive. So that is the complexity of the human hardware. But we are really software. We are working software. And what is the complexity of the software? It is what the brain processes. And we used to say we had three parts of the brain, the reptilian, the limbic, and the neocortex. Now we are creating an exocortex that will have super intelligence. And we will connect our brains to the internet in the next two decades. The complexity of the brain is basically 10 to the 11 neurons. Each neuron has about 1,000 connections. Each connection um, synapses computes at about 10 to 100 hertz, which is very slow, very, very slow. Your mobile phone computes in gigahertz. Your brain computes in 10 hertz, in 100 hertz. Your phone is millions of times faster than your brain. The difference is that you still have more neurons than your phone has transistors, but this will change. This will change in the next 20 years, and your phone will be more powerful than your brain. We will connect the brains of different animals, and actually, I love to talk about this. We will have telepathy in the next 20 years. We will communicate mind to mind, brain to brain. This will happen in the next two decades. And we will connect to the robots, and robots will have feelings. And robots will be fantastic. Look at those incredible robots. And for the ladies, don't worry. You will have your macho robot <laughs> that will not get tired at night. <laughs> but we think that robots are bad, yeah? Even female robots are bad. Even when they have robot sex, they are bad. But are they good or are they bad? It depends on where you live. If you live in Japan, you know that robots are good. Robots are better than humans in Japan, and that's why they are doing so many robots. But this is not humans versus robots. This is humans and robots. And this is the first cyborg. And then in um, 2020, we expect to have the Olympic Games uh, for robots in Tokyo. So this is the merge, the symbiosis that we call transhumanism, which is using science and technology to enhance humans, to improve humans, but carefully, carefully. We don't want to finish like that. Anyway, uh, just to finish, we are going to be curing all diseases. In five years, we will have no paraplegics. In 10, 20 years, we will not have these horrible diseases. No Parkinson's, no Alzheimer's, and no aging. No aging. We are going to see the death of dead in three decades. But we have to think about the dark side of the force. The dark side. Always carefully about this. So let's think about the illuminated world and two alternatives, South Korea versus North Korea. Where do we want to go? To the future or to the past? And so I finish with this meditation to the future and a beautiful Chinese phrase that means crisis. Crisis in Chinese has two characters. The first character is danger, but the second character is opportunity. So get ready for a fantastic future full of oppor opportunity. Thank you very much.